everyone such a beautiful evening. Uh, my name is Vicki Stevens. I'm the curator at the Life Saving Museum. And I'd just like to second Helen's welcome to the Nantasket Beach Lecture Series. This series is provided monthly by the uh, Health Life Saving Museum, the Friends of the Health Public Library, the Department of Conservation and Recreation, in partnership with the Nantasket Beach Resort. And would also like to thank Greg Bennett and Hull TV for filming these lectures and making them available to a wider audience. So thank you. And tonight we are delighted to have Sally Snowman here, who is the keeper of Boston Light. Sally is the 70th keeper of Boston Light and the last remaining Coast Guard keeper of a lighthouse. So it's a wonderful thing that we have um, such a wonderful view of Boston Light here in Hall. And we're delighted to have Sally here tonight as well as her husband Jay and Paula Marcangelo. So Sally, thank you so much for being here. Good evening and welcome. Um, my name is Sally. And I'm the 70th keeper of Boston Light, and the first 69 were all men. <laughs> so there's a story about why I'm in costume and what's with the bonnet, Sally. That story's going to unfold. But I just want to take another minute to introduce Paula. The Coast Guard Auxiliary uh, is the volunteer component of the Coast Guard. I'm on the Coast Guard payroll. I'm a GS-11 can't do the job alone. Whenever we're out at the island, there has to be at least two people. And we do that through the Coast Guard Auxiliary. These are cadre of 40 especially trained auxiliarists. Paula is one of them, and my husband, Jay, is another. So, <laughs> so when we're finished tonight with our presentation, both of these people will be available for you to come up and tell your stories to them, ask questions, because this is a really big crowd here, and uh, it's, it's wonderful. So we have reinforcements tonight to help um, for those that would like to share stories with us. That's one thing that I have found is that when people come to a program like this, it's because they are interested in lighthouses or maritime history. And there's usually some story behind that, that there's some trace of information. And we like to hear those stories. So please feel free to share those with us at the end when we break up here, because we don't have to leave the room. Sometimes we go to libraries, we just have to pack up and sort of boogie out. We don't have to do that tonight. That's really kind of a cool thing. So um, without any further ado, we're going to start into our program. And Jay, would you find a place like to be able to not have your head in the way? <laughs> and um, this is Boston Light. How many of you, before you came here, took a look out at Little Brewster Island and was looking for the flash every 10 seconds of that light? Were you disappointed? I hope you didn't come a long, long, long way to see that. However, it's for the highest good of the island because it's getting a facelift. Right now, inside the tower, there's 76 spiral stairs and two ladders with 170 years of lead paint that's being sandblasted off. The outside of the tower, is having a new facelift with some new stucco. But before they could put the new stucco on, they had to take the old ones off in that it's rubble stone. We'll talk about that in a few minutes, too, that needed to be repointed. So the inside and the outside's happening. The keeper's house is getting a new roof, new windows, and the sides being prepped and painted all at the same time. Talk about noisy with the workers' radios going, them talking, the hammering of the nails. Um, it's quite the trip out there. So this is what the light looked like before all that scaffolding went up. So tonight what we're going to do is talk about our 300th birthday. Boston Light Light Station has been there for a uh, for 300 years and two more years. So for 298 years, there has been a light flashing at the top of that tower. It's pre-colonial times. 
before the United States was the United States. That's old, folks. And we have public access. We have that through the Park Service, specifically the Boston Harbor Islands National Park area. Did you know that there's 401 national parks? And that to be a national park, you have to have something very special, something very distinctive that doesn't exist anywhere else in the North American continent. So what's so special about Boston Light and Little Booster Island and the harbor? You're going to see a slide on that, and I'm going to tell you that story when we get there. But in the meantime, the Boston Harbor Islands National Park is going to have its 20th birthday in 2016. The National Park Service is going to have its 100th birthday in 2016. And federal agencies cannot fundraise. So the Coast Guard can't fundraise. Boston Harbor Islands National Park can't fundraise. The National Park can't fundraise. So the Boston Harbor Islands National Park area has a fundraising agency called the Boston Harbor Island Alliance. It's their 20th birthday in 2016. So just imagine all the planets and the suns all lined up to have four very powerful anniversaries in 2016. So that's the story that we're going to weave tonight. And so we can't just talk about the Coast Guard who owns, operates, and maintains Boston Light without talking about the Park Service and Boston Harbor Alliance. And we also have another agency that volunteers out there, the Friends of Boston Harbor Islands. Do we have any friends in the audience? <gasps> We've got one. <laughs> and, we <laughs> Woo! and we actually have 15 friends that volunteer, but not this summer. And um, so that's just another agency that we toss into the mix out there. So with no further ado, here we go. Jay, next slide, please. All right, so here's a recap. We have four agencies involved here. We have the Coast Guard. Dun, 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 dun. They own, operate, maintain, pay my salary. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> There's a law in 1989, and those in the area, the Hilarians, may remember this with Ted Kennedy and others that said, hey, wait a minute, they're about to automate Boston Light and take the Coast Guard active duty off the island. That's the first established Coast Guard light station in the country. We've got to protect that. So a law was passed in 1989 that said that Little Booster Island Boston Light must remain manned, yes, the word manned, <laughs> with a Coast Guard presence. You know what else that happened in 1989? It said that Boston Light has to have public access for the public to enjoy and to visit for educational purposes. Now, what did the Coast Guard think of that? We're not tour guides. We don't give tours at our places. What is this? Well, just in the nick of time of all that, the Boston Harbor Islands National Park was established in 1996. They had three years to get tours running out in Boston Light. So in 1999, the Park Service offered its first pilot season, six weeks, on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, to tour the island. However, some might know that, hey, you know, I went for a visit out at Boston Light before 1999, how did I do that? Well, the Friends of Boston Harbor Island started giving tours out there in uh, 1986. They ran a tour on, um, uh, in June, July, and August. So there was three opportunities, and they had big crowds that would go out like 110 people. So now we have formalized 16 weeks, except for this year, because we're a construction site, the opportunity to go out and visit. And we do that through the Boston Harbor Islands National Park. And because the Park Service can't fundraise, they can't handle money from the public, the Boston Harbor Island Alliance sells the tickets to go out to the island. And the Boston Harbor Islands National Park 
is a part of the National Park. So those are our four agencies that are all going to have birthdays in 2016. Really awesome. Next. All right. Now, remember the statement about there being 401 national parks in the country? And to become a park, you have to have something very, very special. And you were sitting on the edge of your chair to find out what that is. It was a glacier that happened seven to 10,000 years ago. And when it receded and the water melted, what did it do? It raised the water. And what it made was a beautiful harbor, a harbor that allowed for commerce as well as protection from, like, the enemies. So it had the two most critical things that were sought. And they knew that back in the 1500s when explorers from Europe came over and found it. So it started being colonized in the 1600s and into the 1700s. And so we're going to continue our story with the next slide. Uh, All right. uh, so here we have um, a map of the Boston Harbor. And do you see the red dot? Well, back in 1716, that was the only safe deep water for the ships to come into the harbor. And if you notice, it's kind of narrow right here. And that's called the Narrows. <laughs> <laughs> so it would come in Nantasket Roads. And um, we're uh, a little off the map right now with a chart. The hotel is right here where my finger is. Uh -huh. So if you come up here, see the, the elbow of the peninsula? So the ships would come across the sea and they'd want to go around all these islands to come in safe to the harbor. Now, what was happening is if they missed the entrance right here, they would flounder on the Brewsters and the Graves ledges, and the ships would crack open like eggshells. The cargo and the people would go in the bay. People died. And it really hurt the development of the colony when they lost all the goods that they were waiting for. So they said, we need an aid to navigation. We need something big to say, this is the way, a way shower into the harbor. And they had a choice. They could put it over here at Point Oliden and Hull, or they could put it over here in the Brewsters. Now, when they landed or washed ashore, shipwrecked here on this side, we have a sandy beach. Um, we have um, small rocks rather than ledges. And it was the mainland. So if they floundered here, there was an opportunity to salvage the cargo, salvage the people, and sometimes even salvage the ship. Not so out here. So they chose to build the lighthouse on a one and a half acre at high tide, three acres at low tide, little Brewster Island. And the light was lit in September of 2016. 2016. <laughs> I'm catapulting. Yeah, 1716. <laughs> And so the keeper that was there, the island has been continually manned for 298 years. So if those in the audience know their lighthouse history, they know that Boston Light is not the oldest standing lighthouse. You know why? We had something called the Revolutionary War, and the British said, if we can't have that lighthouse, we're certainly not going to let the revolutionists have it. And they blew it up on the way out of Dodge. So the one that stands there today, the one that has all the scaffolding around it, the one that's getting the facelift, that's the new one, 1783. Still predates the country. <laughs> so in, uh, however, the second to oldest lighthouse that was built was Sandy Hook in 1764. That lighthouse was left alone by the British. Too so many Tories. <laughs> and so, they're the oldest standing tower, but we're the oldest Coast Guard light station, meaning that there was a house, there was a barn, there was pier, um, there was an outhouse, and there was a lighthouse. So that's how our claim to fame is in that today the Coast Guard still maintains not only Boston Light, but over 45,000 aids to navigation around the country. We are a world-class aids to navigation system 
And it's not just us citizens saying that, other countries tell us that we have got a fabulous system here. So the Coast Guard is committed to keeping Boston Light continually lit. Now this is a rendition of what Boston Light would have looked like in 1716 before the camera. We don't know if it really looked like this, but look at the trees. No trees. My hypothesis was that at that first winter of 1716, 1717, it was cold. They needed wood to keep warm, and they chopped down the trees. It might have been gone even before that. So we are, we are treeless out there. In the next slide is another rendition. No? Did it jump? Uh, well, that's okay. No, we, we'll, we'll go with it. It's not our show. <laughs> and here we have today um, the Boston Light as it um, appears today without the scaffolding. And if you notice that it has the keeper's house, it's got a boat house, it's got an oil house, it's got a generator room, uh, the cistern is tucked behind there. That's what constitutes a station. And it's uh, 89 feet tall. And Jay, can you put the little cursor up at the tippity top? I love talking about the lens, the Fresnel lens. It's 155 years old. 336 individual prisms. I call it the crystal Christmas tray. That's all um, bubble wrapped right now in behind plywood to keep it safe as they do the interior of the lantern room. Next. Okay, we talk about public access. So the Coast Guard owns, operates, maintains, manages Boston Light. There's a congressional law of 1989 that says that it must have public access. One of the ways that happens is with the Park Service coming out on this particular boat called the Motor Vessel Columbia Point from UMass Boston, another agency that helps us with our tours, and they land on this dock. It's a $1.8 million dock that took two years to build that the Park Service built. So a lot of people are confused as to who owns Boston Light. The dock is owned by the Park Service. The island is owned by the Coast Guard. We are in a partnership together. So although um, so many people say, think that I'm a ranger, I'm Coast Guard. <coughs> Next. Uh, that money that it costs to get out there, it's a national park, mm -hmm. so you're not paying for the park, you're paying for the boat ride out there. Uh, if you didn't hear what Jay said, what you're paying for when you come out on this boat is not the tour of the island, that's free. Because it's Coast Guard property, we cannot charge. It's for the boat right out there. Okay. And then once you get to the island, the, um, this really shows how small it is. You go up the walkway, and the boathouse is our welcoming center. So everybody who comes to the island, the first stop is um, at the boathouse. Next. So this just happens to be a park service tour. But the other way to get to the island <laughs> is um, with your own boat, like kayakers. However, we're a construction site this year, so we're not allowed to have any drive-bys. So when the kayakers come, they can rest because we don't want them to become a search and rescue case because they were too tired and get washed out to sea. They can rest a few minutes on the island. But they too, once they pull their kayaks up, they go into the boathouse for their welcoming. And because we have a safety spiel, we give them. Next. And here we have the east end of the island. On the left, we have a cistern building. And then on the right, we have the tower. And so when the Park Service bring tours out here, there is an hour and a half on the island where you have the opportunity to walk the 76 spiral stairs and um, go up into the lantern room. Next. I think it's great because when you come out from Boston, it becomes a Three hours. Yeah, it's three hours. <laughs> it leaves Boston at 10, gets back at 1, leaves at 1.30, gets back at 4.30. So if you know what that tune is, they're sort of kind of showing your age. <laughs> okay, so how do we staff the island? We have the Coast Guard Auxiliary Volunteers. We've got Park Service Rangers. We've got the Friends of Boston Harbor Islands 
three different uniforms. If you call, then, then there's the keeper in her uniform. And so this is what you would see, a combination. But we're all we're in a partnership. And we're all trained in the Boston Light history. And to be able to um, allow you to walk the island and just watch the seagulls go by, or if you want to engage in hearing about the history, we'll share that with you. Or if you have a story to tell us, we've got good listening ears. Next. Now, this is the treat, to go up to the top of the tower and be nose to nose with a classical 155-year-old lens. And um, the way that it works, whether you're a drive-by or come out on a park service tour, it's a small group of eight that go up to the tower, take in the views, and come on down. You have 15 minutes to do that. So if you do the math, if you're on a park service tour, an hour and a half out there, we have a maximum number of people with groups of six that take turns going up there. And the view is spectacular. Especially in the fog. Especially in the fog, yes. <laughs> then that's another kind of experience. And um, this is a bird's eye view. And um, I actually took this picture coming back from uh, Mississippi last September out the, out the air, airplane window. And it's just sort of phenomenal to see um, how, Jay, can you use the pointer and show where the hotel is? It's, uh, keep going to the left, right up, little, little toward me, little toward me. You're right there, folks. <laughs> and then if you come uh, to the front part, Jay, uh, Boston Light is um, down front and center. And these are what we call the outer Brewsters here. And this really gets to show you how Nantasket Roads was easy to miss back in 1716 and why they needed that aids to navigation on Little Brewster Island. And you see that logo? That's brand new, folks. You're the first public to see this. It's our 300th anniversary logo. It took over six months for the committee to <laughs> negotiate <laughs> what it was going to be. And um, another further story. Did you know, for those who live in the area, that Graves Light was sold, the Coast Guard sold it? And the name of the family is the Wallers, Dave and Lynn Waller. Turns out that Lynn is a graphics artist by profession, and she was the one that put that logo together, the finishing touches. So we got a little bit of Graves Light in here tonight, too. Uh, we talk about history. Uh, not only do we tell the story of like the history of the light, but we also talk a little bit about all the keepers that have been keepers and assistant keepers for 298 years. And one of the things that lighthouse keepers did as a tradition was put their initials in the stone around the island. So you never- the oldest graffiti around. <laughs> yes, oldest graffiti around. This one has particular um, story to it. The SW is for South Wales, which is London, 1768. And above that, see that little crown? That is the Queen's crown. This is the oldest graffiti we have found so far. So when visitors come to the island, either by, um, by um, a park service tour or by their own boat, they're invited to walk the stone to see what they can find. And if you find something older than that, please let the staff know. This picture here was taken sometime between 1870 and 1875. The woman's family that took the picture, she grew up in summers at Great Brewster. And at low tide, you can walk across to Little Brewster Island. And so this tells stories. Look at the lawn. Do you see things on the ground? That's laundry. What's laundry doing on the ground? Well, that was before electricity and dryers. And it's moist out there. And it's windy. Average 20 knot winds. Try to hang something on a line. Not going to stay there very long. Put it on the ground. Let the sun heat on it. And it dries out. 
The other thing is we have something that looks like a little doghouse. And one thing that was hard to find was, um, was water. And so they would have wells, efforts to make wells. It wasn't very successful. And then before they painted the house white, it was just allowed to weather the shingles. The only thing that was white was the lighthouse tower. And where the two people are sitting on the stone, on the rock, the keeper's house right now that exists, when you look out the um, window and stand on your tippy toes and look down, there's the rock. So whoever took that picture was standing where the keeper's house is today, which was built in 1884. This is um, another picture taken in the 1870s. The house looks a little bit different. And um, what I like about this picture is you can actually see that there's something wrapped around the lens. The lens back in those days was on just for night. So it went on at sundown, was turned on at, at sunrise. They didn't want the sun beating on it during the, during the hot, especially summers, because it could damage the prism so that they would wrap it up very similar to the bubble wrap we have it around now. And we have another building, 1884, the Keeper's Principal's House that's there today. Um, that was an add-on. Now, when you think of technology, you think of needing less personnel, less help. Just the opposite. We needed more help, especially not only are we a light a light station were also a fog signal station, and they had apparatus that needed to be maintained. So they added a principal's house, and the original house that was built in 1859 became um, the two assistant keepers' houses. It's a duplex, so one family was on one side, one family was on another. And then, in 1895, they gave it a facelift. They added an attic. Yeah, the keeper's house is still attached to what we call the museum room of the, of the vestibule. But you even have a better look at what those efforts to do, uh, get well, to get water. And this is the view from the tower back in 1940s. Um, when they had two piers out there. So the boats or visitors would come in between the two piers for safe water uh, because it can be pretty rough out there. We also noticed that the keeper's house has a barn. It has an outhouse, and we also have a boathouse. And we also can see Great Brewster Spit. And there used to be another lighthouse all the way down at the other end a mile out. That's another story. What a, what's what thing? They look like, like, like ropes. Ropes See them? This? Yeah, that. And those, are, those are boardwalks. Those are walkways. That's to keep you out of the mud. Yeah. See, I look at that and know exactly what it is, so thank you. I'm looking, you know, people not going familiar with Boston Lane. That's the walkway. Pretty cool. And this is one of the 1940s, 1950s, an angle that shows how small a one and a half acre island really is. And this is an aerial. And you'll see that the two piers are kind of beginning to be dilapidated. And you can see all the buildings that are on this slide. We're going to look at the next one to see what's missing. We're missing a house. What happened in 1960 was the Coast Guard automated automation said, we do not want families and children out on the island anymore. It's too expensive. It is too dangerous. And they made it what we call a stag station. So there were three active duty personnel from 1960. They didn't need the, sec the keepers, assistant keeper's house. So they burnt it down because they didn't know how else to get rid of it. So that was the end of a big era. It was no longer a family Coast Guard light station. At one time, there were three keepers, three keepers' wives, and 19 children with three outhouses on a one and a half acre island. Oh my goodness. 
tell them we didn't have indoor plumbing until uh, the Yeah, even the keeper's house and the house we have are in, we live in now, it didn't get plumbing until like 1956. After Sputnik went up, they, that's when they put the indoor plumbing at Boston Light. <laughs> All right, we have a $1.2 million restoration job going on right now as we speak. This was May 5th when they arrived with the, uh, we start bringing the equipment to the island. And they have two forklifts. We don't have a road. So what did they have to do? They had to build one. Some of them might recognize the tug. Oh, if anybody hears that, uh, um, again, a uh, Hilarian, the contractor for the boat transportation is a Kushnet, um, the McDevitt family. So that's their tug in their barge. See the road? <laughs> the first thing they had to do was make that so that they had a way to bring all the supplies to the other end of the island. And see Boston in the background? So close, but yet so far away. And here we have the scaffolding with a little hat on top. Not only are they doing the inside of the tower and the outside of the tower, but they're doing the roof on the tower, too. How many here are familiar with Flying Santa? Ha, huh? yeah. <laughs> Flying Santa began in 1929 in Rockland, Maine. And today we have the Friends of Flying Santa, Inc. that still make um, visits to Coast Guard stations and including Boston Light. And one year, um, I was up at the, on the outside of the tower by the lens, and the helicopter flew overhead and took a picture, and it said, oh my, that roof needs a painting. Well, 10 years later, it's getting one. <laughs> so we are the Little Brewster Campground. Right now on the island, we have six contractors sleeping on the island. We have three in the trailer. Uh, one thing that wasn't here when we took this picture was a tent with two in that one, and then we have one sleeping in the boathouse. And then we have five to six that come out every day, and they work Monday through Thursday. So there's 11 to 12 workers working on the island, trying to get this all done by the end of September. Is that a salt tower? Is that a cell tower? This? No. That's, that's a weather station. Yeah. Um, it's a National Weather Service weather station that's been condemned. So part of the instrumentation works, part of it doesn't. Uh, we're working on getting another one. Does the light still light? Not tonight, because it's wrapped up so they can do work in the lantern room. But if not, that 155-year-old lens would be flashing every 10 seconds, 24-7. In my bedroom. Into her bedroom. <laughs> I have the 10 seconds. <laughs> it's not lit for four to six weeks. And if anybody's a boater here, there's some, something called the local notice to mariners where the Coast Guard announces any anomalies that are out there. And it says that Boston Light is at reduced visibility. We're on a backup light that can only be seen for nine nautical miles versus 27 when that nine foot crystal is flashing. In this picture here, this is up at the tower looking down at the scaffolding. Isn't that a cool picture? I just had to throw that in there. If you were confused by the walkways in the other picture, <laughs> this is probably pretty disorienting. And in closing, um, here we have Little Booster Island. One of the things that the keeper loves to do is put in a, a flower garden every year, and it's in full bloom right now. And um, so we just want to recap what it is that we're hoping that you're going to walk away with tonight. One is that Boston Life's going to be how old in two years? 300 years old. How old is the National Park Service going to be in 2016? 100. How old is the Boston Harbor Islands National Park area? 20. How old is the Boston Harbor Island Alliance, the fundraising agency of the park? 20. That's something to sing and howl and dance about in 2016. And for you hilarious, that's happening literally in your own backyard. And the Hull Life Saving Museum is one of the 
uh, partners and in the committee that's planning these shindigs, so the, they will be offering programs. <coughs> Don't know what they're going to be yet, Vicki, do we? <laughs> <coughs> and the other thing that we hope that you walk away with is that this is a major aids to navigation, maintained, owned, and managed by the Coast Guard, although the Park Service provides the public access. That's so confusing. <coughs> the Coast Guard has a um, motion picture in TV headquarters out in Hollywood. They emailed me last week and said they had an inquiry of somebody that wants to do a documentary on Boston Light. But they were confused. They have it that the Park Service owns the island. So you can imagine the long email that I sent to them explaining what the confusion is, why it is confusing, and saying that it is Coast Guard. And so, yes, they would have to approve any documentary that might be done out there. So now I'm waiting to hear whether they're, they're going to give permission for the documentary to happen. And it would be perfect if it came out like in 2015 um, to help educate um, the United States of our, all the birthdays that we just talked about. And so uh, the last thing that we want you to walk away with is that um, we do have public access, not this year. So we encourage you that next year, come March, April, go on the internet, Google the Boston Harbor Islands National Park or Boston Light to look at what the boat schedule is. And if it's a drive-by, it's Friday, Saturday, and Sunday from 10 to 5. And, um, a lot of people say, well, when would be the best time to come? Over there we have a table, and our friend Anshin is over there. She has a few business cards that came off the printer really quick tonight that have my email and phone number. So if you're a boater in the area and you want to know about that, take that card, call me in May, and um, make a reservation. And so now we get to say, any questions? Yes. What are your duties and responsibilities while you're on the island? Okay, what are our duties and responsibilities on the island? <coughs> hmm. Back in, in 1716, it would to be to man the light. Light the light at sunrise, close it down, shut it down, sunrise. Did I say that backwards? Yeah, you're right. Oh, okay. On at sunset, off at sunrise. <coughs> However, it's automated. But we do do something called rounds, and what we do is in the morning and in the evening, we walk around, we check all the buildings and make sure that they're locked and they're secured. The other thing that we do is um, we record the local weather, and we report it to the Park Service, I mean the Park Service, NOAA. The, the NOAA uh, weather people. And the other thing that we do is I like to compare what is similar to what that happened in 1716. In 1716, they got their water from the rain. We still do. We have a building called the Cistern Building. Its whole purpose is to collect water. It's got a great big roof to maximize all of that. So when we need water in the keeper's house, we have a tank of 2,200 gallons. <coughs> the main tank is 22,000. We lay six lengths of fire hose from one end of the island to other the other. The thing that happens for me as the keeper is um, managing over 60 volunteers. That's a full-time job right there. And then um, also the media contact so that I'm one that gets in front of the camera a lot and does the interviews. And now we have this outreach program like Paula and Jay. We now have 37 Coast Guard Auxiliary and Friends of Boston Harbor Islands available to go out and do presentations. We're starting specifically with this one to go out to senior centers, um, historic societies, libraries, things like that. So if you have a, a, an organization that you'd like a free, no charge, powerful presentation on Boston Light, we can help you out with that. And if you're interested, again, Anshin has some business cards, and so you'll have my contact information to be able to set a time up for that. 
And you know what? We are over our hour presentation here. And I don't want people falling asleep. So what we're going to do is we'll be available to answer questions and things like that. Um, and some people already discovered that Jay and I wrote a book. It's called Boston Light, A Historical Perspective. Being on the Coast Guard payroll and a volunteer, we can't sell them. We can't touch the money. But Anshin can. <coughs> And um, so if you want to check that out, you're welcome to do that. So thank you very much um, for coming today. I'm going to turn you over to Vicki.